Good morning. Uh, scripture this morning is from Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. It's a book of prophecy. It's a book of uh, current events. Uh, it's talking to Israel uh, specifically, but it's talking to them about what they've done, how they're doing things, uh, what is to come. We're going to be in chapter 3, which is prophecy, um, which he's telling what God has told him to, to say, and that's what uh, prophecy is. But it's also it's talking about what is to come from his perspective and even our perspective. We can look at this and we can see that there are things that are going to happen. Uh, some of them already happened. Some are going to happen. But we can look at them and know that God's timing is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's God's timing. We can look around and we can see these things. Uh, too many people say, well, we know it's going to happen right now because we see all these things. We don't know that, but we can see the things that are happening in the Bible. So I can tell you right now that I see things and I say, well, it's unfolding. I don't know if it's completely unfolded. I don't know if it's ready to happen, but I can tell you that all the things are falling into place. I know I was speaking of this and I was at a family reunion and I said, well, I just think, you know, Jesus Christ is close. And, and I had an aunt who's elderly and she's a godly woman. And she said, I don't think so. I don't feel that. You know, I don't think that's happening. And that's OK. Uh, that's OK. I, you know, I said, all right, you know, that's fine. Uh, I look at it and I see these things unfolding and I say, wow, it's got to be coming. Uh, I know it is, and it just seems like it's close, and maybe maybe that's just me, and part of it maybe is you know just saying, I want it to be. I want it to be because I'm looking around at this wicked world, and I'm saying, wow, how much worse can it get, you know? And and uh, you know, there have been a lot of people throughout history that have said that. Uh, a lot of people have looked at different leaders and thought that they were the Antichrist and those kinds of things. So we look at this, and we just we let the scriptures unfold themselves. God's timing is exactly what it should be, and it always will be right. We don't know exactly what it's going to be, uh, but we can look at this and know, understand that we need Jesus. That's exactly what we need. This world needs Jesus, and, and he's going to be talking to the nation of Israel and telling them that he needs to be their God, and they need him to be their God. Uh, verse 1, it starts out, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come with the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, and they may offer unto the Lord, that they may offer unto the Lord, an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that uh, turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. He had made a promise to him. All right, now we're going to preach through this whole chapter, uh, try to, and and expound upon it. But, you know, God is specifically talking to the nation of Israel, and he's letting them know that you've turned aside from me. When he start, starts talking about this messenger, I'm going to tell you who he's talking about. He's talking about John the Baptist, and this is brought out in Matthew 11, 10, Luke 7, 22, and Mark 1 and 2. It's talking about John the Baptist. This is the messenger. This is the one that's crying in the wilderness that he's bringing about, that he is talking about, that he's letting uh, everyone know the Christ is coming. And he he's the one that said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he's the one that sent his, uh, his disciples to Jesus and said, Hey, I really need to know that this is you. This is who you're supposed to be. He knew it, but he still had to be, he just needed that extra. Uh, we can look at people and say, well, they were they were doubting or whatever, but he needed that little bit extra. But this is who this is talking about. This is talking about John the Baptist. Now, others have said that it's somebody else, but this is this is bear, bearing out in Scripture. It's born out in Scripture in the New Testament that this is who this is. He's talking about John the Baptist, that messenger that's going to come. is going to be talking about Christ. He's a forerunner, we call him. He uh, he was kind of the one that paved the road. He got everything ready. He he uh, was the one that uh, prepared it and said, okay, I, I've got to elevate him. I've got to become less. I've got to go away because he's the one. I've, I've got you going. 
but he's the one. When we preach from the pulpit, when we do these things, we're not preaching ourselves. We're preaching Jesus Christ. It's not about me. There will be other preachers that will come along. Uh, I've got some favorite uh, preachers that I listen to that, that have gone on from this earth. They've passed. Uh, they've died. But I love listening to them. But see, it wasn't about them. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the message of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is. It's about the message of Jesus Christ. He was bringing this to. He said, uh, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come. He said, even the messenger of the covenant. Who's the messenger of the covenant? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the messenger of the covenant. What is that covenant? That covenant is that promise. That covenant is an agreement. Uh, who's the agreement between God and us? Who's the, the purveyor? Who's the author of that covenant? God. He brought it. God and Jesus Christ are the same. And he said, this is it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. He brought it to Abraham. He said, through you, all nations will be blessed. All nations will be blessed. This is what he's doing. And we need to understand that. that he, it, he didn't bring it just to the Israelites. He brought it to all people. And and this is so great that we, we look at, you know, and, and the Jews didn't even realize that. They were like, oh, well, you know, if you don't become a Jew, you can't have it. That's not at all what he said. When And when Jesus landed on the scene, he brought it to us. He brought the covenant. He was the covenant. He is the covenant. He always will be the covenant. He's always agreement. And he said he shall... Uh, uh, come, saith the Lord of hosts, the army of God uh, is there. And then he talks about abiding. Who shall abide in that day? Who's going to be able to stand up in that day? Only those that have believed in Christ. Only those that have accepted him. Only those who have given their life. Only those that have signed on and said, yeah, I agree with the covenant. Folks, you know, you can go and you can get a, an agreement with a bank. And you can uh, say, okay, I want to borrow some money. And you sign on with that. But if you break that, it doesn't mean anything. If you sign on and say, well, I don't really mean it, then it's not true. You've got to sign on. You've got to mean it. You've got to be dedicated to it. And you've got to say, I am going to do this. I really want this. Too many people have come up and just said, yeah, yeah oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. You know, uh, you can go in there and you can say, well, yeah, I'll do it. And when they, when they lay the uh, document down there, you go, uh, yeah, I don't want to sign that. Uh, I don't really want to commit myself. Then they'll say, well, you're not going to do it. You're not going to get it. You know, this is the way it's it's been. And people will come forward and say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I want that. And I, I'm good with that. Oh, yeah, Lord God, if you'll just help me through this, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. But they're not willing to sign the document. They're not willing to sign on to it. They're not willing to do that. And that's where we get Matthew chapter 7, where it says uh, these guys come to him and they, they said, oh, didn't we do this? And didn't we do that? And God, Jesus never says, no, you didn't. Uh, you know, they thought that their works were saving them. They thought that this is what it was. And I know I talk with my hands here, but they weren't willing to. And they convinced themselves, but they had not truly committed themselves. It was just all show. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Actually, he says, I never knew you. And he says, depart from me. But folks, it, it's a sad statement. So, you know, a lot of these Israelites were claiming to be gods, but they really weren't. They weren't following after him. And that's what he's talking about here. He said, you've turned away from me. Who shall stand in these days? He said, "He said this, uh, this messenger, this Christ is going to come as a refiner. He's going to be purifying things. He's going to be making things right. Folks, this, this is not, not something we should take lightly. This is, uh, it should be a little bit scary uh, to, to look at and go, well, you know, we need to make sure that we're following after him, you know, and try to keep ourselves right. Uh, go to him and follow and take the message out to people. Uh, our churches are, are failing miserably. We, we've got program after program, our associations do, and we put out new programs, and some of them are just reiterations of old programs. And, and they bring them on and, and they'll say, well, you can have all the uh, all this program if you'll just pay for what you got. Folks, we've got what we need right here in front of us. This old book right here uh, has it all. This old Bible has it all. We don't need a new program. We need the old one. We need to take it to them. We need uh, what happened. And Jesus talks about this, you know, uh, in this, you know, that you need to come back to me. You need to come back to, to what I have given you. And he said, he said in verse 4, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. We need to get back to former years. We need to get back to the time where this nation of the United States, of America, was following after God. And you say, well, we never did completely follow after God. No, that's 
that's that's correct. I understand that. Not everyone was following after God, but we founded on godly principles. The documents that our forefathers laid down said if we depart from that, then it won't last. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing the crumbling of our nation because we will not follow after God. We're killing babies in the womb. We're, we're uh, uh, going and doing uh, everything that he's told us not to do. We're looking at it and saying, uh, God's world is not right. We're going to change it. We're going to uh, change the order of things. Uh, we're going to say that uh, men are not men and women are not women. And Jesus said he made them male and female. Well, why can't we abide by that and understand that that's exactly what he said and that's exactly what he meant? We try to change everything that God had. And then we say, oh, no, we're, we're still following after God. Uh, uh, we get politicians go, oh, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't believe in anything that uh, the Bible says because we're going to uh, make it an abomination to us and we're going to uh, go against everything that he said. How can we do that and say that we're following after God? We can't. And God's saying this to the nation of Israel, and it speaks loudly to me that this is exactly what's going on in our nation. Uh, this messenger has already come. Um, Jesus Christ has already come. So we, we know what we have, and we've turned away from it. Verse 6, he says, I change not. I change not, for I am the Lord. I change not. It's us that changes, not God. God says, I change not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, not tomorrow, forever. That's what the, the Bible says. He's the same always. He always will be. He always has been. He's always been. And he, he is an eternal being. He's given us an eternal soul. And your soul will spend eternity somewhere, whether it be heaven or hell, whether you be uh, with Jesus Christ for an eternity or you be away from him in hell in punishment. It's not just a separation. It's in punishment. It's not made for you. Uh, God didn't want you to uh, suffer that. He sent a savior for you so that you can accept him and that you can have eternal life. Don't you want to have eternal life? Wouldn't you love to have eternal life today? As a nation, we need to turn back to God. Verse 7, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances. What? My teaching. Look, the Messiah is coming. That's, that's the thing. Is what he's telling. Uh, it, we know this has come. Judgment by an unchanging God there. Um, there was a turning away. Uh, it goes on, and we, we, we hear this preached a lot. They robbed God. And he said, he said how have you robbed me? Uh, through tithes and offerings. You've not given to me. Uh, you've taken away from me. You, you've uh, not done what you're supposed to. I just asked you to do this. I gave you all this. And I asked you to return some of it, and you wouldn't even do it. Uh, so they said, you know, they, they've robbed God. They've turned away from his ordinances. We're supposed to be giving to God. Uh, everything we have is for God. Uh, we pray at our meals. Uh, in my family, even if we're out somewhere, you know, and we do not do the long, elaborate prayers. I know uh, I've been places and, and I can, there's somebody clear across the restaurant and I can hear them praying because they want everyone to know it. Uh, when we pray, we pray uh, to God. We're not praying to everyone else. We're not trying to impress anybody and you shouldn't be either. Just, uh, it doesn't take long. And I will tell you right now, and I've told people before, uh, I don't pray long prayers for a meal, you know, if you're going to a service or something and they're having a potluck, I've, I've been there and I'm like, good grief, man, we're never going to get to eat. Uh, my prayer time is my prayer time. And when I'm praying over the meal, that's exactly what I'm praying for. I just want to uh, pray for that. And I'm talking to God. I'm not trying to impress everybody with how well I can pray. And too many people are trying to do that, you know, and I grew up in churches where some of these guys, man, they could pray heaven down. Uh, man, I'd listen to them as a kid, and I thought, well, you've got to do that, and you've got to say things just this way, and you've got to do things this way, and that's not the way it's uh, supposed to be. It's a conversation between you and God. If you're asked to be to lead prayer, you don't have to go into long, elaborate things. You're not trying to impress the church or impress the group or whoever you're with about your praying abilities. That's not what it's about. It's about praying to Him and taking it to him. He said they've robbed God. He said they delighted in wickedness. They they like it. They like what they're doing. Folks, our nation delights in wickedness. Uh, we enjoy it. Uh, we enjoy hearing about it. We enjoy participating in it. Uh, if you don't believe me, you just look around and you see these people. They enjoy what they're doing. Uh, we enjoy seeing other people do that. We watch things on television, uh, wickedness, and we don't turn away from it because we enjoy that. Uh, we shouldn't be doing that. We should not enjoy the wickedness. We should not be looking at it and going, this, this is great. Verse 15, it said, And now we call the proud happy, yea, that that work wickedness are set up. 
yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. We, we look at that and we say, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, stand up for your rights, you know. Stand up for your right of what? To turn away from God. And we've looked at these things and, oh, well, you know, it's okay and, and we'll, we'll just be quiet. And we No, it's time we stand up and we be bold. You know, well, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was very bold. Jesus was very bold about his beliefs. Folks, when are we going to get bold about our beliefs? Even in churches, when are we going to get bold about our beliefs? I see preachers that aren't even bold about their beliefs. They stand up in a pulpit and, yeah, well, you know, we should be doing it. And, and it's okay. And, and they tell things that aren't true. And those that are preaching hard, uh, uh, there are people that they don't want to hear that. Uh, they've got itching ears for something else, and they want somebody else to say something nice to them. And they want uh, good, hard preachers that are preaching the Word of God out of the pulpits because it disturbs them. Why? Because they're lost as they can be. They're sitting there, they're rolling their eyes in the, in the seats, and, and they're the ones that are teaching Sunday school class and they're doing everything else. I want you to observe something in your churches. you got people that work, and yet they don't want to sit through class. They don't want to sit through a sermon. They'll, they'll take every opportunity to get out of a sermon. Uh, they'll go and do children's church. They'll go and do uh, something else, whatever it is, to keep from sitting there and listening to a sermon. Why is that? Why is that? Why don't they want to listen to a sermon? Why don't they know anything about their Bible? Why do they go in and do all these kinds of things? Because they're lost. That's what it is. They're lost. They need Jesus Christ. Uh, they're under conviction and they don't want to listen to it, but they, they go into there and they teach and they, they do all these things. They're the ones that are going to be standing before Jesus. And folks, if you're one of those people, let me tell you something. You need Jesus Christ. You don't want to be standing there before Jesus and going, what? Depart. You, you don't know me. Your name's never been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. These people had a form of this, but they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know God. They just said, oh, yeah, we're, we're part of it. We're part of a nation. Uh, you may be part of a church. That does not mean you're a Christian. Being a Christian means you're a believer in Christ. And uh, Barna put out surveys, and, and, and it's, it's terrible. The last ones he came out with about all the ones that, that uh, believe that there's other ways into heaven, but they claim that they're a Christian, uh, that uh, don't believe in, in uh, coming together and worshiping God, uh, that, that don't believe in the Holy Spirit, just all these kinds of things, and it's, it's disturbing what our church has become. It's disturbing. It's disturbing to see what it's become, but you know we see this and we know that this is going to happen. It says there will be a great falling, of what? falling away. Well, you had to be somewhere in order to fall. I'm telling you what, you will never fall off a ladder if you never get on one. I promise you. You can't fall off a ladder if you stay on the ground. You understand what I'm talking about? The great falling away is those who said that they believed in Jesus, the ones that went to churches, those that, that claim that they know. This pandemic, we've seen so many that have left the church. And I, I'll tell you what, I really believe it was those that never truly believed in Jesus Christ and they took an opportunity because they were able to stay away from church without people calling them up and going, hey, been missing you. Uh, why haven't you been away? Everybody said, oh, it's okay. Uh, you know, they're away because of of, of uh, the virus and, and, you know, they won't come back because of that. They're scared. You know, there is a lot of fear. I understand that. And there's a lot of uh, reasons for doing that. But a lot of these people have taken that opportunity to say, man. I get away from that now. That nobody even calls me anymore. Nobody even cares because they say, oh, well, you know, uh, that's why. There's been a great falling away. Some churches, you know, have never never come back. Uh, some churches are closing. Uh, things are, are uh, bad in different places. Folks, we need Jesus Christ. But we've elevated wickedness. Uh, you think about it. Those who commit wicked acts, a lot of us don't even look at it anymore. It's just like, oh, yeah, whatever. We don't talk to our kids about it. We don't talk to anybody about it. We don't tell our children, hey, don't be like that. Don't be like that movie star. Don't be like that that uh, music star. Don't be like that person. That's not right. We don't give them good role models. This nation was going along with the flow and just said, because we belong to the nation of Israel, we're going to be okay. I hear too many people say, oh, well, we're a blessed nation. You know, God's not going to do that. Why do you think that? He took Israel several times to task. He took them into captivity. He even talks about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you into captivity. I'm going to scatter you. He's going to bring them back. But folks, why would you think that we are so 
special that God would not bring judgment upon us. He said he's a judgeful God, he's a just God, and he doesn't change. If he did it to the nation of Israel, why do you think he wouldn't do it to us? You say, oh, well, we're a godly nation. Are we really? You know, one of our presidents got up and said, you know, we're no longer a Christian nation. And everybody got upset, myself included. I got upset to the fact that he said it, but then I got to thinking about it. And I thought, you know, he may be right. He may be right. We have turned away from Christ. We act like we're Christian. We act like this. We bring it out and say we are, but are we really? Or are we just mouthing those things? Even in churches and places of worship and, and everything else, we just do these things. We go to we go to different things and, oh yeah, amen, amen, you know, and then we go off and do other things that are wrong. We elevate the wicked. We pay money to see the wicked. Maybe, maybe we have completely turned away and we can't call ourselves a Christian nation anymore. You know, and I, I know what he meant by that, but I'm telling you, we have turned away from him. We've gotten completely away from him. They robbed God. They delighted in wickedness. Uh, he, he begged them. He said, turn back to me. Turn back to me. Today, God is asking the nation of the United States, turn back to me. He's asking the church to turn back to him. You know, in Revelation, it talks about, he said, I stand at the door and knock. That's not an individual. That's at the churches. He said, I've been knocking at your door and you won't open up. Jesus has been thrown out of churches. <laughs> Believe it or not, he's been thrown out of churches. You go and you, you go to different churches and a lot of times, man, Jesus isn't there. They're not even preaching Jesus. They're preaching, oh, well, we need to do this. I want to ask you something. You pray for your pastor. Is your pastor preaching correctly? You go to a church that doesn't preach Jesus? Maybe you're looking for a pastor right now, and I'm telling you, a lot of churches are without pastors right now. Maybe you're looking for one. Are you looking for a godly man that's going to come in here and preach and lead the way you're supposed to? Or are you looking for somebody that's going to come in here and pat you on the head? Oh, you're doing okay. Don't worry about it. He'll be all right. Yeah, just go on and do what you're doing. we got too many that are doing that way. And that's where we get. We, we get led away. We allowed prayer to be taken out of our schools. Man, they used to pray in my school. We used to, uh, uh, teachers would pray with us. We would, we would uh, listen to the word of God. I had a teacher who would read the Bible. Nobody ever complained. Nobody ever got mad about that. Try to do that today. Well, you can't do that. There's supposed to be a separation of church and state. That's not in the Constitution, by the way. Uh, a lot of people don't know the Bible and they don't know the Constitution. You need to read that thing. Find out what it really says. We've taken it out of everything. We've asked Jesus to leave. And he said, okay. And he stepped away. He said, I want you back. Please turn back to me. I'm begging you this morning as an individual, won't you turn back to God? Won't you give him what he's supposed to get? Yourselves, your time. Say, Lord, I want to be back with you. He said, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Man, we ought to be speaking one to another. We ought to be encouraging one another. Hey, praise God. Thank you. Amen. Pray for me. I appreciate that prayer. That's what. That's the kind of things we should be speaking to one another. We should be saying, hey, I'm a little bit down today. You know, it's too many times we, well, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine. Doing fine. And you're not. We need to be honest with one another and say, Lord, you know, I, I, I'm down. I need some prayer. He said, Though the fear of the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and they that thought upon his name. Won't you think upon God's name today? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know him as your Savior? Do you know that you have eternal life? I'm talking about not thinking it, but know it. You know that you have a relationship with him. Relationships are different than acquaintance. It's not just knowing who Jesus is. It's not having a, a granny who, who was godly. It's not having a preacher who's a, a godly man or an aunt or uncle. It's having a relationship with him, speaking to him every day, knowing him. Verse 18, it said, then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Discerning means knowing the difference. 
He said, if you'll do this, you'll discern, you'll know, you'll come back to me and you'll know the difference between it. You got to start having a conversation with him. You got to start reading his Bible. You got to find out what's wicked and what's righteous. Without this standard, we can't know. We got to get back to this point. We got to get back in God's word between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. We gotta, we gotta get back to knowing the difference. We, we look at everything and we just say it's the same. I, I truly believe that uh, there are people that are not getting saved because they look at uh, the people that say they are, and there's no difference between them. They go out there and they do the same things. They say the same things. They act the same way. They watch the same things. They listen to the same things as the world. Uh, uh, in fact, they've even brought it into the church, saying, oh, well, if we do these kind of things, we'll attract all these people. And that's not the truth, and it never has happened. We need to get back to the Word of God. We need to get back to being able to discern between the wicked and the, the uh, righteous and know which is which and know which to listen to and know which to discard. And you have to do that. You have to discard that wicked message. You have to get away from that. You can't have that in your mind. You can't have it in your house. You can't have it anywhere near you. You need to get rid of it. Replace it with something else. Replace it with the righteous. Worship God. He said, they'll, they will come back to me. Malachi is trying to tell us, and God's giving him this message. It's the last book in the, the Old Testament. It leads into the New Testament, and it talks about it, and it's even talked about in the New Testament here. And we see this. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That comes from Galatians 6 and 7. Do you understand that? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. God knows what's going on. You can't fool God. You can't say, oh yeah, I'm a righteous man. I'm a righteous woman and I do the right things. But yet, when you get away from the public eye, you do the wrong thing. It's about having a relationship all the time. You know, I married my wife almost 36 years ago, coming up. I'm married no matter where I go. Whether I'm in her presence or I go away, I wear a, a band to show that. So that the world can know that. I want people to know that. When I go somewhere else, I'm still married. I'm still obligated to her because I made a covenant with her. You made a covenant with Christ. It's a covenant that stays with you always, not just when you're in the public eye or not when you're in the church house. All the time. I hope that you've accepted Jesus Christ. I hope that you know him as your Savior and that you've given your heart to him. I hope that you have lived a life and that you're still living life. You're, you're expressing that. If you haven't accepted Christ, you can go to him right now and you can say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner because all of sin comes short of the glory of God. I know that the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know that if I confess the Lord Jesus, make him God of my life, and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. I want that salvation. I want to have it. I want to have that new life. I want to be that new creature that God has promised. And I know, Lord, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means you. Won't you accept Jesus Christ this morning? And if you have accepted Jesus Christ and you've gotten away from God, won't you get back to him? Won't you say, Lord, I need to be back with you. I need to strengthen that relationship. Won't you say, Lord, help me this morning. Help me to get back to you. I love you. I want to be part of you. I don't want to be away from you anymore. This nation needs to be back with you. It starts with the individual. Then it goes to the groups, the churches, the state, the nation. We need a revival in our nation. We know that Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to be a judge. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day, but I do know that he's made promises and he is coming back. And that's what he said. I will come back. So won't you accept Jesus Christ? Won't you give it all over to him? Won't you say, Lord, Please accept me. I accept your covenant. See, it's not about what we bring to it. It's about what he's already brought to us. We just accept it. Go ahead and read the whole book of Malachi. Man, it's a great book. It's got so much stuff in there. God's unchanging. He never has changed. He never will. I celebrate that. You know, we elevate all these people when we shouldn't be. Jesus Christ is the only one that we should be elevating.
I hope that you will have a blessed day. I want to thank you for listening to me. My name is Charles Morgan. I'm with Word of This Live Ministry, uh, uh, listener-supported ministry. Hope that you can help us out. Go to our Facebook, go to our YouTube, go to our website. Thank you for allowing me to be with you this morning.